The day of prophecy has finally arrived. The Kwisatz Haderach has arisen. The princess must prepare herself for what is to come. You've been preparing me my whole life. It's okay. I'm here. Tell me, what was it about? Dune Part 2 is out and it's had a massive splash at the weekend box office. The latest figures put the film at over $200 million worldwide. But did it live up to the expectations of fans? And what are the biggest differences between the movie and the book? Join me, dear viewer, as I dive back into the world of Dune and its many secrets. Overall, Denis Villeneuve's rendition of Dune is a fairly faithful adaptation of Frank Herbert's original vision. But that doesn't mean the movie was a one-to-one -one adaptation and made several notable changes to the source material. After David Lynch's 1984 version, many people thought the book was basically unadaptable. The 2021 version in Dune Part 1 inspired confidence in the book's readers as that was almost a one-to-one -one adaptation of the first 300 pages of the book. There were still tons of scenes missing from the first movie, but Denis Villeneuve still managed to bring the world building, the story, and the character development to life, thereby raising the bar for Dune Part 2. It's a pretty well-known fact that Denis Villeneuve is in love with Frank Herbert's novel. Villeneuve once again did the work to adapt the second half of the book as closely as he could while still fitting within a three-hour runtime. But due to the time constraints, he did have to make a few changes. I've already mentioned the lack of exposition about anything Spice Guild related or any of the other major houses. But let's take a look at some other differences there were in the movie. The Time Jump The timeline changes in Dune Part 2 as Denis Villeneuve's sequel removes a time jump that occurs in the book. The movie takes place directly after the events of Dune Part 1, and judging by how Jessica's pregnancy progresses, only a few months pass throughout the course of the film. This differs from the book, as Frank Herbert implemented a two-year time jump shortly after Paul became part of the Fremen. This allowed for various relationships to develop and slowed Paul's ascent to power. Dune Part 2 removed the time jump and sped up the entire narrative. Jamis's death. Paul killing Jamis at the end of Dune Part 1 is something that still factors into the sequel, but the fallout from the book is not explored. In the book, Paul becomes responsible for caring for Jamis's wife and kids because he killed him. Jamis's wife Hera becomes Paul's servant, marking the beginning of an important relationship. Dune Part 2 does not include Hera in any capacity, as the movie fails to implement this portion of Fremen culture. But that's a minor difference if you ask me. The fear Hawat is completely missing from Dune Part 2. The biggest Dune character missing from the sequel is Thufir Hawat. The fate of the Mentat for House Atreides was not directly confirmed in the first film, paving the way for the sequel to follow the book with Thufir's story. In the book, he survived the Harkonnen attack on Arrakis and began working for the Baron. He played a vital role in manipulating the Harkonnens behind the scenes and trying to find Muad'Dib, only to learn that it was Paul. This leads to Thafir dying after refusing to kill Paul. This entire story is absent from Dune 2, which is a shame because I really like Stephen McKinley Henderson's rendition of the character. Count Fenrig is absent. Count Fenrig is completely gone from Dune Part 2. Another character missing from Dune Part 2 who had a major role to play in the book is Count Fenring. He is part of House Carino, making the trained assassin in Mentat a relative, close friend, and advisor to Emperor Shaddam. While Dune Part 2 includes his wife, Lady Margot Fenring, he is nowhere to be found. This is despite the fact that the Emperor orders Fenring to kill Paul in the book. Again, I don't think this one is that big of a deal, but maybe it can work itself into Dune 3. Aaliyah Atreides One of the biggest ways that Dune Part 2 changes the book is with Aaliyah's role. Instead of Paul's sister being a two-year-old child with the mental capacity of an adult like in the book, she remained in Jessica's womb for the entire film. Casting Anya Taylor-Joy as Aaliyah Atreides means she still has a small role to play, as she can speak to Jessica subconsciously. Since Aaliyah is an inherently difficult character to adapt properly in live action, this book change does make some sense. 
It'd be really difficult to get a toddler to sit or stand still and emote different feelings. But this also meant that Dune Part 2 had to change other things too. Paul and Chani's son. Paul and Chani's romance is a major part of the story in Dune Part 2. But the movie does leave out the development of their first child. This happens largely because of the removal of the two-year time jump from the book and how Denis Villeneuve changed Chani's character perspective on the Lisan al-Gaid prophecy. While not mentioned or shown in the sequel, Chani gives birth to Paul's first child, Leto II, in the book after they've spent two years together. However, tragedy strikes the family when Leto dies as an infant during an attack on a Fremen siege. I would have actually liked to have seen this, but I can totally understand how this would have added to the runtime significantly, and we can't have another disaster like Killers of the Flower Moon. Part 2 makes Chani a part of the Lisan al Gaid prophecy. Now, I've already mentioned in my last two videos that Chani's character was changed in that she wasn't a skeptic of Paul's prophecy in the book. But Dune 2 changes the book in another significant way by making Chani a part of the Lisan al Gaid prophecy. The film incorporates Chani's Fremen name, Sihaya, which means Desert Spring, but it adds more weight to it. Chani mentions it early on that it's tied to some prophecy, and it's only after Paul drinks the water of life that her connection is revealed. When Chani cries when Paul is in a coma, her tears are mixed with the water of life to bring him back to full consciousness, fulfilling part of the prophecy not from the book. Gurney's Revenge Gurney Halleck's return in Dune 2 comes with a new story point for the character. Denis Villeneuve followed the books in connecting Gurney's backstory to Glossu Robin Harkonnen, played by Dave Bautista, who was responsible for giving the warrior a scar on his face and killing his family. The book showcased the Fremen killing Robin, but instead the film gave Gurney the pleasure of revenge. This change allowed Dune 2 to give Gurney a more satisfying ending, as he avenged his family and filled his desire for Harkonnen blood. Paul doesn't kill Baron Harkonnen in the book. The ending of part two includes some notable changes to the source material, including other major Dune 2 character deaths like Baron Harkonnen. The movie showed Paul Atreides killing his grandfather after storming the meeting between the Harkonnens and the Emperor. In the book, it's actually Aaliyah Atreides that kills the Baron, not Paul. In the movie, it's more direct and added a layer of disrespect by having the Baron's body dropped into the desert to be eaten by bugs. But let's face facts, that fat fuck was one burger away from a heart attack anyway. The Great Houses don't challenge Paul's ascension to Emperor in the book. The final scenes of Dune 2 include another change as Gurney reveals the Great Houses will not honor Paul's ascension to become Emperor. In the book, his threat to destroy all spice mines on Arrakis leads the guild and the great houses to sit back and watch the events unfold. Frank Herbert's novel doesn't directly say what the great houses' reactions were to Paul becoming emperor, but the idea that they immediately challenge his rule is new. It seems like this is what Dune 3 will feature prominently. Chani doesn't leave at the end of Dune. Where Dune 2 leaves Chani's story is arguably one of the biggest changes to the book that Denis Villeneuve's movie makes. After Paul becomes Emperor and proposed to marry Princess Irulan, Chani stormed out of the room in anger. Dune 2's ending leaves her in the deserts of Arrakis as she calls for a sandworm to come get her. The implication is that she feels betrayed by Paul, is frustrated by who he has become and the prophecy, and might ultimately leave Muad'Dib behind for a simpler life. This is a dramatically different ending for Chani than Frank Herbert gives her. In the book, Chani is hurt by Paul's decisions, but she ultimately understands why he is making them and that the marriage to the princess is purely transactional. She stands by Paul's side throughout it all, accepting her place as his concubine because she will be treated like his wife. These are just some of the differences in the movie from the book, but what do you guys think? Do you think these differences detract or take away anything from either the book or the movie? Please do let me know down below in the comments, and as always, hit that like button, ring that notification bell, and smash that subscribe button, and I'll see you in the next one.